ES Audio. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Curtis, the Standard's Chief Theatre Critic. I'm Nancy Dorrant, Culture Editor. And I'm Nick Clark, Deputy Culture Editor. Coming up, we'll be talking about A Streetcar Named Desire in the West End, starring Patsy Ferran and Jana Vassan and Normal People's Paul Mescal. See, I, I once went out with a doll who said, uh, I am the glamorous type. I am the glamorous type. I said, so what? And what did she say to that? She didn't say nothing. That shut her up like a clam. Oh, did it end the romance? No, it ended the conversation. That was all. That's on at the Phoenix Theatre, but for a short run, so get in there quickly. And for our second show this week, we'll be chatting about Berlusconi, a new musical. That's on at Southwark Playhouse's new space at the Elephant and Castle. Plus, our interview this week is with Matthew Modine, who you'll know from Full Metal Jacket or perhaps Stranger Things. Matthew is currently starring in To Kill a Mockingbird at the Gilgit Theatre. It gives people the opportunity to see what that racism looks like and to hear how ugly that language is. My hope is that every person who leaves the theater has a better understanding and a more open heart and wants to do what they can in their everyday life to bring that kind of racial hatred to an end. So what's been going on this week? Well, rather shockingly, a survey this week has found that 45% of uh, theatre front of house staff have considered quitting as a result of abuse, drunken misbehaviour or assault. God, um, we can't get away from bad audience behaviour at the moment, can we? We were talking about that last week. We were. And it's, I mean, it is it is clearly something that has been a problem for a while, but has got worse since the pandemic. This is really quite a shocking statistic, don't you is think? This is, this is something I've seen in the wild. Now. Wow. Yeah, uh, Tina. Tina the musical. It's basically, it just sort of highlights the split between those who want to go and listen to the singing, the brilliant singing on stage, yeah, yeah. and those who want to sing along. And I think some drink had been taken that <laughs> night, uh, but certainly... Some audience members took issue with others trying to sing along and uh, it escalated in the end. um, (laughs) The front of house had to intervene um, and remove them. And they're really not trained for that stuff either. Not really. And they're really not paid for it either. Really not. It shouldn't really be a frontline activity. It's boozing, isn't it? That's the key to all of this. I mean, you don't have a... Big old problem. I mean, everyone gets pissed off in the theatre, but you don't get that cross without, as you say, having partaken (laughs) of of the the grape, as it were. I don't know what the answer is, really. I mean, theatres have got to make money. Yeah, I don't know what the answer is either. You commissioned me to write a piece about this, which is still available at (laughs) standard.co.uk, where I, I... was remembering, you know, back when I started writing about theatre in the late 1980s, um, (laughs) it was pretty rare to be able to take a drink into a theatre. You know, the only place you could really do that were pub theatres like like the King's Head. Um, I wonder if it is just not allowing people to take it in for the actual performance and insisting that they drink it you know, but, I mean, I don't know whether that would work in Tina. I've got a suspicion that you might <laughs> occasionally in some of the shows where it's a bit more sort of stag slash hen you might find people kind of smuggling it in in water bottles. But yeah. also um, a lot of musicals are trying to combat this by putting on special sing-along performances, which yeah. feels to me like quite a good That's idea. That's a very good idea. It's a tough one, isn't it? Because you don't want to overly police uh, no, audience not behavior. At all. To, to not you. At all. And, and also there's a, there's a weird thing about the idea of theatres being places of reverential silence, which no. they, historically they weren't. And No, exactly. You know, Chucking really oranges. Yeah. Well, it's one of my favourite stories about the great Victorian Shakespearean actor who had half a dead sheep lobbed at him. <laughs> <laughs> I sort of admire whoever smuggled half a dead sheep yeah, into no, a theatre. They were doing bag searches, weren't really, they? <laughs> <laughs> they really were. Yeah, well, maybe he was wearing it, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so so the well, we don't know the answer, do we? No, but we, we don't. It's, but it's something that obviously is going to have to be addressed. It's a moment of flux, I think, and they're trying to work coming. it out. Yeah. Right, shall we, um, shall we kick off with our first little... Our first show? Yes. It's Street Car Name Desire. Where's Stella? Out on the porch. I'm going to ask a favour of you in a moment. What could that be, I wonder? Some buttons in back. You may enter. A little show that's had barely any notice paid to it. Started in a small North London theatre called the Almeida, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, uh-huh. And it's got some bloke in it called... Phil. Paul, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Paul Mescal. Oh, yeah, that guy. Uh, as Stanley Kowalski. I haven't seen it in the West End. I saw it at the Almeida. Yeah, so did I. But Nick Clark, yeah. you saw it in the West End lo- last night? On Tuesday night, it was the gala night at the, at the Phoenix Theatre. A yeah. very starry night. I mean, there were, oh, your Stella McCartney's, Ooh. your FKA Twigs's, really? your Jack O'Connell's. It really was That's a, what you get for an Oscar nomination, I guess. <laughs> it brings them all out into the firmament. It's 
blimmin' good, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's magic. It's really, really good. This is uh, with him for a theatre credit to admit, but I don't actually like Tennessee Williams very much. I find his plays really usually quite prurient. That said, I've never seen a bad production of Streetcar Named Desire, I don't think, but this mm. is an exceptional one. To nick a, or paraphrase an old quote about The Godfather, you go for Paul Mescal and you come out talking about Patsy Ferran. Yeah. yeah. Because I've never seen a Blanche quite like it. And in fact, I'm going to make a big statement here. I think she's the best Blanche I've ever seen on stage. Wow. Mm. Okay. I spoke to the director, Rebecca Frecknell, a couple of weeks ago. She talked about sort of stripping it back, that the play had calcified a little bit, had built up layers of cliche mm. that has sort of perpetuated on stage. And her job was really to bring it all the way back. And for the first time with a Blanche, I understood the character. Mm. I've always been impressed by how uh, people have portrayed her, but I've never really connected to or understood why she's done what she's done. Mm. And for the first time, I felt her pain. I understood what she was going through and felt absolutely devastated at every step of the way. Yeah, she's very yeah. understated, isn't she? She doesn't fall into that kind of cliche, that yeah. sort of Southern Belle cliche, which is very easy, I think, to fall into and very seductive, yes. actually, for both the actress mm. and the audience. Yeah. Um, but she doesn't do that. She just does it. And <laughs> lest we forget, she learnt it in a week. <laughs> yes. because she well, she's got a bit more time this time. <laughs> she's got a bit more time this time. She's probably got a few more rehearsals under her belt this time. But she stepped into the production at late notice after the previously cast actress Lydia Wilson had to withdraw due to an injury. And... Given that, it's an extraordinary performance. Yes. And what's really interesting, and it's been brought up again this week, is that a few people have suggested that she might have been too young for the role. Mm. Now, again, speaking to uh, Rebecca Frecknell, she was very surprised. She thought she was too young, but went back to the text. And actually, Blanche in the text is 33. Now, wow. we're so used to seeing mm. these grand dams of theatre play the role because it's such a great role mm. yeah. that actually... In our minds, it is a woman who's much older, whereas, in fact, Patsy Ferran, who is 31, she's only two years shy of the character. It's a bit like a Lady Macbeth, isn't it, in a weird sort of way? You mm. always expect her to be a, an older woman, and yeah. actually, when I've seen it played by a younger actress, you suddenly understand the ambition yeah. and the kind of, like, the, the lack of understanding of the consequence. Mm. I thought Anjana Vassan was the best Stella I've seen, actually. Yeah. She's much less subservient. You get the sense that she's actually kind of, in the intervening years since she left... Um, Belle Reeve, their home, and came to New Orleans. She's toughened up and got into the habit of talking back under the domination, in, sort of in response to the kind of sp sparky, doesn't really seem like the right word for it, but 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 her relationship with Stanley. Yeah. Um, and his domination, although it's in many ways uh, very destructive, it's also kind of spurred something in her that she may not have had before. So the feeling in, in Jana Vassan's performance for me was that when Blanche turns up, she's much more prepared to talk back to her at the beginning and it's only later yeah. on where she sort of starts to see her unravel and and she kind of slips back into her habit of trying to look after her. But the relationship between the two women, the two sisters, is absolutely central to this as well. It's mm -hmm. not just about, you know, Stanley and Blanche. This is very much a, well, a three apparently the director was sent a letter that, um, or a copy of the letter that Tennessee Williams wrote when he first pitched it to his agent, which was in an exhibition from a few years back. And in it, as he pitches this show, he basically focuses on, he says it's a story of two sisters. Mm. Right. And actually, yes. in the play, Kowalski doesn't come in for quite a long time. I mean, th this production changes that by having all the actors on stage the whole time. So yeah. he is there from the beginning. But normally, he doesn't really come in mm. until the sisters have really established the relationship between them. Yeah, mm. It's really interesting, isn't it? I think Rebecca Frecknell does a really good job of elevating that relationship yes. in a yeah. way that perhaps previous directors haven't done. She yet. has form in that she yes. did uh, Summer and Smoke at mm. the Almeida, which was, her, I think, her first big hit as a director. Also and with Mark. Patsy Ferran. Yeah. Well, and with Anjana Vassan. I mean, Mescal's performance is great, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, sort we of, should talk sort about of it. Lupine, <laughs> muscular, very, very threatening. It's feral. Uh, sort of, it yeah, is sort feral. of lurking in the background all the Behind time. that smile at the beginning. coiled and, yes. Yeah. But what's interesting, because, again, the thought was that Paul Mescal might have been a bit young. Mm. But funnily enough, and we don't think of him as young, but he was the same age as Brando in the film. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You know, yeah. he's sort of now a timeless figure in that film, but yeah. actually he was a very young man. Just a, one thing on that performance, on his performance, not Marlon Brando's performance, which was, you know, fine. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, what I really liked about him was this sort of fascinating contradiction. I think it works well as a young man as, as well, is that he sort of embodies the kind of toxic masculinity of the time. But he's so confident in it. He is so confident in his own masculinity that he 
also keeps his emotions and not just his rage very, very close to the surface and isn't afraid of of expressing them. So, you know, his sort of primal shout of her name, it's not just about him, you know, feeling guilty and it's not just about him feeling um, angry and being an abuser. It's also about someone who is feeling things incredibly deeply but isn't scared to show it. Mm. Dwayne Walcott, though. Oh, well, yeah. Just briefly, yeah, he was who great. Plays Mitch, who is uh, um, Blanche's suitor, gentleman caller. Yeah, he's not the usual schlub, is no, he? No, exactly. He gives, brings real dignity to that part. Mm. Um, so we've been talking about it as a sort of three hander. It's sort of a four hander. I mean, yeah. it's not, his is not the most important role mm. or as prominent as the other three, but. Uh, well, it gives Blanche that moment of hope just at the end of Act One. It was the first time yeah. I felt really thought, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he's great. He's sort of like. Because she flatters him at one point and talks about she talks about his muscles, doesn't mm, she? Something yeah. like that. And actually, Dwayne Walcott is in extremely good shape. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but his response is to be sort of bashful, but pleased about the fact that she's noticed. Mm. You know, so it's just it, it it works just as well. I think we mentioned earlier about uh, theatres need to make money, and mm. they are making money yeah, with yeah. this one. Um, Damn right. The other the other big news story this week is that it'll it'll set you back three hundred and five pounds for one of the higher price tickets on this, and seventy seven pounds for a restricted view. Wow! Now, some people might argue that a restricted view of these actors is is worth it. You know, they're that, yeah. they are that good. Mm. I mean, that is taking this extremely good, extremely enjoyable show out of the reach of a substantial yeah. swathe, yeah, yeah. a huge swathe of the population. It is a shed load of money. Absolutely. And these are commercial productions, you know. Yeah. these are They are fully within their right to make money and charge what they can charge. And so there's not, it's that. not in That's theory, it. they're, you know, they're not getting public funding. You can argue mm. that it is not their responsibility yeah. to get more people in. However, if they want to draw a, a new audience who mm. will eventually become um, affluent and will eventually be prepared to pay 80, 200, 300, 400 pounds for a ticket, they kind of need to start getting them in now. Anyway, it's, anyway. I mean, it's, it's, it's one hell of a show. It's yeah. great. It's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a fab show. It is. Right, let's go to a quick advert break. Coming up, Matthew Modine joins us to chat about his latest role in To Kill a Mockingbird. And Stranger Things, of course. In the meantime, why not hit that like button and give our podcast a rate? You can find that in the main show page. I'm at the Gilgo Theatre with the star of To Kill a Mockingbird. Welcome to the Evening Standard Theatre podcast, Matthew Modine. It's actually Superstar. Superstar. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's quite right. That's yeah. the that's the no, appropriate I'm... moniker here. I wonder if you could just situate the world of To Kill a Mockingbird and also your character Atticus Finch. Okay. The book is told from the the point of view, and as is, as is the play, from the point of view of my daughter, Scout. And it takes place in 1930s Alabama, which was very much uh, broken by the Civil War, the American Civil War. It was a slave state. And this is a story about a, a black man who's accused of raping a white woman. And the Aaron Sorkin adaptation is very much about the, the trial and the repercussions of the trial. There was a movie that was made with Gregory Peck, which was much more... The trial was a part of the story, but it was really a story about the adoration of the daughter for her father, Mm. this good, righteous man who was defending a black man, and a peculiar neighbor uh, named Boo Radley, Mm. you know, that that she was so, her and her brother, uh, Jem, are so curious about. But for America, it really is a sort of culturally significant uh, book. I wonder if you can sort of tell us how important it is. It's an important story because... It's not something that happened in 1930 that isn't happening in uh, 2023. Mm. That uh, when the play was being done in New York City, the African-American actor who was playing uh, Tom Robinson, the black man accused of raping the white woman, he said it's weird to be doing a play about 1930 America and walking out into the streets of New York and having it be so relevant mm. that that kind of prejudice and racial profiling that goes on uh, is is very much a part of the American fabric today as it was then. And the thing that's great about doing the play by the end of my run, almost a quarter million people will have seen my Atticus Finch mm. here in the West End, is that it gives people the opportunity to see what that racism looks like and to hear how ugly uh, that language is 
And, and my hope is that every person who leaves the theater uh, has a better understanding and a, a more open heart and wants to do what they can in their, in their everyday life to bring that kind of racial hatred to an end. Many people look at the book and sort of feel like it's set in aspect, but actually I felt this was very modern of someone kicking against a society that ultimately sort of consumes him. Yeah. I, I shared this wall that right next door to me is where Cecilia Noble, who plays Calpurnia, and during rehearsals when we were establishing our relationship with one another, we both agreed that they're two people who love each other a great deal. They're described as they have a relationship like a brother and sister in, in the play. What we agreed upon was that Calpurnia sees the world as it is, especially as a black woman, and Atticus sees the world as he hopes it could be, you know, that the, the possibility of kindness and forgiveness and, and, and seeing the good in people rather than rushing to point the finger at the mistakes and the bad that, pe that, that we're all capable and, and guilty of. That's a wonderful thing that I, I have with, with Calpurnia as Atticus. Um, but th but that's it. Atticus, you know, he sees the world as he as he hopes it could be, and probably the biggest influence I had in my life was working with Stanley Kubrick on Full Metal Jacket, and they say that I think it was Renoir, Renoir the filmmaker Renoir, he said that, that filmmakers make the same movie over and over again, and I, I really feel that Kubrick, in many ways, was making the same movie over and over again, in the sense that if you look at 2001: A Space Odyssey and you see that early man who discovers a bone. And he can use that bone as a weapon, and he beats another early man to death. And Dr. Strangelove dropping the bomb on the world. Unless we continue to evolve, which, you know, it'd be foolish to think that we've reached the apex of evolution as human beings, that we have a long way to go. But as long as we keep resorting to violence, like Putin is doing right now in the Ukraine, to, you know, to conquer another country, to beat another person into submission, that these aspirations that we have of being a good society and being kind and forgiving, that we, we just keep slipping back into a caveman kind of, you know, maybe cavemen were more civilized than, than modern man. You know, I mean, half a million, uh, and half a million, half of the United States voted for Donald Trump. So... There's something that's not right. Yeah. And I wonder, you know, this is a book written in the 60s about the 30s. Uh, a lot of people have done uh, read when they're younger, but they might forget quite how dark it is. And actually, that speaks to your last point in a way that actually it does look quite unflinchingly, even if Atticus doesn't always want to or wants to see the good in people. It is quite a dark text. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Very dark I mean, text. It's, it's, un, it's un, uh, it, you know, but my my mother said, the, the room was full of monsters and it only takes turning the light on to make them all go away. And, and so what, what we have with when you read Harper Lee's book, when you come into the theater here at the Gilgood and come into this dark space and have light exposed to the, that ugliness, uh, it, it, it's a first step in making those monsters going, going away. We, ha we have to shine light on it. We have to be honest and, and look at it and recognize it and say, that is not something that I want in my life. It's not something I want in my culture or my society. And how have the fans responded when they've talked to you about it? How have they connected with it in, in those terms? Oh, the, the reception is unbelievable. My castmates, they always say British people don't stand up. They don't get out of their seats and give standing ovations. And we have a standing ovation just about every performance. And, you know, it's quite humbling. It's quite humbling also because I grew up in Utah. I was born in California, grew up in Utah. And to be invited to come to the West End and do a play in London, for me, it is, I, I don't know how to put it into words of, of what a compliment, what a kindness, what a what an honor it is for me to have this privilege of, of standing on the boards of the John Gilgood Theater. It's been a while since you've been here. I think 2006, am I right? Resurrection Blues? Uh -huh. Well, I mean, that, that was an extraordinarily weird experience at the Old Vic Theater. On paper, everything sounded like it was going to be amazing. Yeah. It was an Arthur Miller play that had never been produced called Resurrection Blues, directed by Robert Altman with Academy Award winner Max van Sydow. It was going to be amazing. And then we discovered that the play wasn't that good. And we weren't allowed to change anything in the text. That was a condition of Arthur Miller's daughter. I mean, Robert Altman said to me, he said, I don't know what this scene's about. I don't know how to fix it, and I'm not allowed to, so figure out how to play it, you know. And it was a disaster. 
It was kind of like there's a really famous play called Noise is Off mm. about all the things that go wrong in the backstage. And, and uh, yeah, the, you could make a movie about the making of Resurrection Blues. It was a gigantic mess. But you know what? <laughs> I'm really, really happy I did it because, you know, I, I skateboard and, you know, you, I fall down a lot. Um, but you have to fall down if you want to learn how to do tricks. You just It's just part and parcel to, to, uh, to, to growth. Is. You know, you've been in so many great films and different generations will have different great... I mean, I grew up with Full Metal Jacket. Others will talk about Dark Knight Rises. Uh, the one I must talk to you about is Stranger Things, which has introduced a whole new generation to uh, your acting. And, and I don't know if you've seen, but they're taking that to the stage. And I wondered what your <laughs> thoughts on, on bringing this massive show to the West End is. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy for the Duffer brothers who created the show. Um, it's the same producer, Sonia Friedman Productions, that brought To Kill a Mockingbird to the West End. Um, she brought Harry Potter to the West End. You know, she's a very wily, smart producer. And I think it's very exciting for everybody that it's going to have its beginning here in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I, I'd suspect that, like, the, we share the wall with Les Miserables next door at the theater, the John Gilgut Theater. And I, I think that I'll probably be pushing up daisies before uh, Stranger Things show goes off in the West End. I, I, I don't see an end to it. And, w- and what does it mean to you, the show? Is it sort of great to suddenly be in something that is just reaches so many people? You can't compare the su- success today. Of, let's say, because you mentioned Full Metal Jacket. Um, in the 80s, if, if a film was success, successful in 60 territories around the world, that would be unbelievable. Netflix is in over 190 territories around the world. So the kind of exposure that, that my young castmate, Millie Bobby Brown, after the first season, the kind of fame and notoriety that she had was something that had never existed in the history of entertainment, to be that famous that fast and, and that globally. So what does it mean to me to be on a show like that? It, it, it's fantastic because I got another generation of fans, not just fans, but fans from all over the world. It's humbling. I'm grateful for it. And, um, and I, I hope that uh, I can find, you know, some, some other show that can be as successful <laughs> as that one. And uh, I realize it's set in a different time period, but could you see yourself on stage in Stranger Things? I don't know anything about what it's about. What I would like to know is, like what a lot of the fans would like to know, how, <clears throat> you know, when you get a job, usually you have some kind of qualification to get a job. What were Dr. Brenner's qualifications to get a job working with children and teaching them to, to develop telekinetic powers? I think that's a really interesting question that should be answered. I'd like to know why Dr. Brenner didn't die when the Demogorgon attacked him, or when in season four, when Vecna, Henry, killed all the children, why didn't Dr. Brenner die? Um, and in another moment, Eleven uses her power when they're down in the silo, and when he's in, in season four, she tries to use her powers against him, and he says, you didn't think it would be that easy, did you? You know, I wonder what the Duffer brothers are up to with, with those kind of things. So was Dr. Brenner sort of patient zero? Was he number, you know, was he the, you know, is that how he got the job? Because he had his own skills. There's a lot of road left to run. On the... Yeah, I think those, those are all interesting questions. Fantastic. I don't presume to have the answers to. <laughs> <laughs> that was Matthew Modine speaking to me at the Gilgit Theatre. Coming up after this quick ad break, we'll be reviewing Berlusconi, a new musical. In the meantime, why not give us a rating? Five stars is preferable, or even leave us a review. Hi, I'm Danny Mays, and you're listening to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Welcome back to the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. Uh, For our second show, we're going to chat about Berlusconi, a new musical at the Southwark Playhouse Elephant, written by Ricky Simmons and Simon Vaughan. So I haven't got to see this one, uh, but as a lover of all things Italy, I'm very keen to. So, Nick, is it any good? Uh, The short answer is no. Oh, no. Um, (laughs) This is... um, a real mess, I think. Uh, yeah. I don't really know why it was done. I no. can't really see the point of it. It's the, just not good enough. It's just not good enough. The two authors who are former actors. From uh, Grange Hill. From Grange Hill. Oh. And uh, one Back of them's a recording artist. 
As far as I can tell from their biographies, they don't have any track record in musical theatre, and it shows. Oh, yeah. They claim that this is supposed to be an examination of power rather than uh, a straightforward biographical musical about Berlusconi. And it's neither, really. Mm, it's just mm. this sort of meandering, slightly scatological, rather middle-of-the-road pop rock minestrone of, um, <laughs> of <laughs> cliches, really, oh, isn't dear. it? Yeah. If we were Italian and we knew sort of every nuance of the Berlusconi story, then it might work. But it, it's sung through. When I read the word sung through in the the programme, I have to admit, my heart did absolutely sink. And yeah. quite rightly so, it turned out, because... Most of the songs spend too much time, or, you know, most of the music spends too much time at the start explaining why, and it leaves absolutely no time for any kind of deep emotion or explanation, exploration of the moment. And then you get to the interval and you don't know where it's going, by which I mean, it's not like, oh, I wonder what's going to happen. It's more you've just got no idea what the point is. Yeah, it's weirdly sort of divorced from reality, isn't it? There's hardly any mention made of the sort of proper politics of the time. You get mm. the briefest skeleton of his life, yeah. you know, the sort of rise from cruise ship entertainer to property developer yeah. to media mogul to owner of AC Yeah, I mean, that literally, but like after the, after the number of him on the cruise ship, like the rest of that from the age of, I'm presuming, about sort of 25 to 55 is dealt with in about six minutes. Yeah. And you just like, oh, right, suddenly you bought AC Milan and you're one of the most powerful men in Italy. Okay. Yeah. I do love the fact that he was a song and dance man. And so in that sense, a musical could have been the right form for a show like yeah. this. And yeah. And there, there is something buried in there about how he learned to be a crowd pleaser, which also bears explanation. But actually, all you really get here is the two broad brush views of him which is his view of himself as Jesus Christ of Italian politics yeah. as I believe he referred to himself he very much once did. and uh, other people's view of him as a, as a demon you know most notably his ex-wife the prosecutor and a news reporter who's also a former lover of his yeah. um, it's just really bizarre and it, you just keep going back to these two things him saying aren't I great and grinning and seducing people and lots of people going he's the devil he's the devil we're going to get him this time and nothing happens and it's there's sort no characterisation either is there there's like, no none like pretty much much even of him no. <laughs> actually because he's a sort of larger than life character and then everyone else is just there to say stuff yeah which but he's doesn't... not even really a character is he? he's just this big grin and a sort of uh, yeah. and, a, and a widow's peak really the actor who plays him Sebastian Torquia is um, approximately 50 years too young yeah which need not necessarily matter but you just feel that there's 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 no nothing for anyone to latch on to no he feels a bit miscast actually I have to say it's sort of full of indications that he's short and stocky and he is neither of those things he looks yeah. more like Jim Hacker from Yes minister than he does like Silvio Berlusconi and I yeah. think in a case like this where where his visual aspect if you like is so well known it's very distracting that he doesn't look like Silvio Berlusconi like even slightly yeah but there's no threat about his Silvio Berlusconi you don't feel the sexual threat and the political threat doesn't feel real either like there's no moment when you just think if somebody uh, were to cross this powerful man what would happen to them. Like yeah. There isn't any inkling of that. I don't know, it's, it just feels a bit pointless. Yeah. My favourite, actually, was Matthew Woodyard, who plays um, Berlusconi's kind of fixer and best friend, Antonio, who was a sort of brilliant chess geek at school who, uh, for, if, you, if this story is to be believed, Silvio stood up for in the playground. And I thought he was the best thing in it because mm. he was actually acting with his face at every moment when he was in view yes. and responding beautifully to everything. I just came out with a really strong conviction that I desperately want to read Antonio's deathbed memoir because like, he was the guy, you know, who was there. He was the kind of guy doing the dirty work in the background, or at least that's intimated in the, in the you know, sorry, please don't send me a lawyer. That's he was the, there in the room where it He was there in the room where it happens, Hamilton, exactly. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. And possibly even when Berlusconi wasn't in the room for various legal reasons. But <laughs> I thought that was great, but I'm just desperate to read that book. Well, that would probably be a more profitable way to spend an evening, I think. <laughs> <laughs> going to see this show. There are a couple of good songs in there. Mm -hmm. You sort of sense there are a couple of things that there are a couple of moments where you think, oh, what this might have been. Yeah. Um, there's a great one, All the Right Buttons, sung by the news reporter. I'm the Smoking Gun, which is a song sung by Natalie Kasanga yes. um, in the, the, the uh, character of a girl who goes to a bunga bunga party and something very unpleasant clearly happens to her, but it is not entirely clear what that is. Possibly that's a legal thing. <laughs> like it yes. may well be. 
uh, problematic to be more specific, but that was the only moment when I felt even remotely moved. Yes. Um, but then there's a very, very funny number, which Berlusconi sings with Putin, <laughs> very funny. which is hilarious. Yes. I have to say, that was very, very funny. And the, about the only moment then when the staging takes off. I have to say, yeah. this is one of the worst sets I've ever seen. It's in not. Three decades. Which disappoints me because I, I read the script and in it, the provocation is Roman Forum meets Price is Right, which is just in my head sounded brilliant. Uh, yeah. Uh, now, I mean, it, it makes a lot more sense of it. Yes, it does. Right. Whereas it's basically a, a set of rostra and very, very steep steps, which people are endlessly having to sort of edge their way around or teeter up or down. It's a or, funny, funny shape. And there's little um, hatches that flip open and yeah. sort of arms and heads pop out. They were um, quite funny, I have to say. They were funny the first two yeah. times. They were funny the first two times and then they were annoying. The 18th or 19th time, especially when you you see the cast having to sort of edge their way and not fall down these Yeah, things. exactly. And the slam every time they open, <laughs> yeah. which is a bit problematic. So, uh, Mamma Mia, <laughs> don't go again. <laughs> <laughs> If for any reason you do want to go uh, and see Berlusconi a new musical, it's at the Southwark Playhouse Elephant until April the 29th. And just to finish up this week, uh, we should mark a fairly sad week in theatre, both, mm. both on and off stage. Paul O'Grady died at the age of 67, who was a mainstay of Panto and of Miss Hannigan in Annie, the, in yeah, numerous tours yeah. of the musical. And drag as, pioneer. A drag pioneer, as well as a great, you know, sort of hero of the mm. pioneering gay Absolutely. cabaret scene of the 80s. And a lovely man. I interviewed him once when he was going back into Miss Hannigan, and he was just the mm. most charming man you could ever meet. He's one of only two people who ever contacted me afterwards and offered up a mobile number because he felt I hadn't had enough material oh, uh, because I'd enjoyed him in t- for 20 minutes in his dressing room before he went on stage. Just the, the nicest man. I know people who knew him personally as well and, and you know, he's he's a great loss. But also, uh, we lost Janine Shalom this mm. week, uh, the publicist for Premier PR and before that for the National Theatre and the Almeida who's someone I knew for 30 odd years. Yeah, um, she was a pillar of the theatre, wasn't she? Really she? Was. You never thought she she'd really fall. Was. And I, I think some people, you know, who don't know the theatre well that well might be surprised or, or you know the sort of w- workings of the theatre well that well might be surprised at the sort of outpouring of sorrow over her. But, but it's such a tiny world. You yeah. know, we all, everybody knows everybody else. Yeah. Janine was a mainstay of that for 30 mm-hmm. years. Absolutely professional. As as another critic remarked, he knew absolutely nothing about her life. I really knew nothing about her life whatsoever. But you know, she was someone I met on a on a weekly or bi weekly basis for for three decades. Very very professional. Fiercely defensive of her shows and the mm. people she looked after. Uh, yeah, I think she she'll be terribly missed. Yeah, yeah, I think that's absolutely true. That's it for this week's episode of the Evening Standard Theatre Podcast. I'm Nick Clark. I'm Nick Curtis. And I'm Nancy Doran. Make sure to listen to our previous episodes too. We've got chats with Jenna Coleman, Stephen Moffat, Marisha Wallace and Daniel Mays, and many more besides. You can find all our reviews and news online at standard.co.uk. We'll see you next week. Music.